like sit behind me. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our program, What's New, What's Next? Customizing COVID-19 Prevention Approaches in Transplant Patients to Increase Uptake, Excess, and Efficacy. Important note is that one of the pillars of prevention, whoa, thank you. One of the pillars of prevention was the combination drug Tixat, Jevimab, and Silgajevimab, Evusheld. And as of January 26, 2023, it was um, no longer authorized for emergency use in the United States. Information about monoclonal antibodies that have been revoked and available options can be found at the following site and also at the other site. Uh, one is uh, from uh, the um, NIH and the other one is from ASPR. So welcome, and uh, I'm going to be the moderator today, Shmuel Shoham. Uh, to my right is Gadi Haider uh, from uh, UPMC, and uh, to his right is Charles Cook, who's a uh, uh, transplant patient. And uh, thank you to Peerview for providing this session and to AstraZeneca for providing the educational grant for this symposium. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please complete the pre-event survey. And as a reminder, look out for additional follow-up polling during the presentation. Submit your questions, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session, but we may try to answer them sooner. So this is a hybrid program, and um, there's uh, uh, viewers and listeners at home, and uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, if you are uh, either here or as part of the hybrid program, please use your computer or your had in front of you to send questions. We're not going to do question and answer in the usual way where people come up to a microphone and ask a question because of the mechanics of this uh, hybrid program, but we don't want to stifle conversation and uh, debate, so please send your questions in and we'll address them as they come in. Um, you can visit uh, at uh, peerview.com to view the slides and practice aids. And our goals for today, so we'll explore methods for improving the uptake of COVID-19 prevention, the ones that are available now, and increasing engagement and following science-based evidence. We'll discuss how to develop customized COVID-19 prevention plans and provide tactics to overcome barriers and improve patient access to needed COVID-19 prevention. We'll also have uh, a patient voice, and that's uh, Charles Cook. Uh, he is uh, a patient that underwent heart and kidney transplant. And uh, the other uh, members are myself and Gotti Heider. So with that, I'll start by uh, introducing Charles. Uh, uh, please tell us a bit about yourself. All righty, we'll get this started. My name is Charles Cook. I'm 54 years old. I'm the father of two fantastic young adults, one son, one daughter, born and raised in the great state of Georgia. Almost 17 years ago, I moved to Canada with my wife. Uh, I had suffered a massive stroke, which was caused by a heart condition that I was born with that I didn't find out about until I was 17 years old. After the stroke, we figured as a family, the best thing that we could do would be to put ourselves in a situation where when and if something happened to me, then she and the kids would be surrounded by a large support network available. That meant moving close to her family, and that's how I wound up in Canada. Since I've been in Canada, my heart condition works into the fact, or to the point that I went into heart failure, and with heart failure, there are only three outcomes, artificial heart, heart transplant, or death. I've experienced all three, and yet here I stand before you today. I wound up needing a heart transplant and receiving one in 2016 in a surgery that was supposed to increase the life of my failing heart, my kidney function was lost due to complications from the surgery, and I wound up going on dialysis, and then a year and a half after my kidney transplant, or my heart transplant, I received my kidney transplant. Thanks, so one of the things that uh, I learned about you when we were uh, uh, talking is that uh, you're a, a fan of a, a specific football team in uh, Georgia. The Atlanta Falcons, my hometown heroes. And I am a fan of the New England Patriots. That would be the uh, six-time Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots. And uh, uh, we decided that if we annoy each other, we'll have a safe word. So uh, 
I will say to him 28-3, which was the score when the Patriots made their valiant comeback, and he'll say to, to me. me. <laughs> and I will say helmet catch. Helmet catch, which, I don't uh, was a painful moment in Patriot history. So if you hear those terms, that's us uh, talking to each other. Gotti does not like football, but uh, we're working on it. <laughs> All right. Um, so COVID-19 uh, was uh, a traumatic experience for all of us, but as a transplant recipient, highly immunocompromised. Tell us a little bit about the experience of living with immunocompromised in the era of COVID. Well, it was super scary at first because the doctors told us right away that if you get COVID, you're going to die. So I had to treat everyone that I met as if they had COVID. So I took all the necessary precautions, masked up everywhere I went. I've got my mask today, you know, taking it off up here. Um, washed my hands and stayed out of crowds and did everything I could just to, you know, prevent being around people that might give me the infection. Yeah. Now, uh, in the U.S., and from what I saw with uh, some news about Canada, COVID and masking got weirdly political. Uh, have you experienced any people looking askance at you saying, you know, why are you wearing a mask? Or uh, All the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't care, you know, how they look at me. I have to protect myself because even though they say the pandemic is over, to me it's just like they're saying flu season's done. You can still catch a cold. You can still catch the flu. And if you're as immune compromised as I am and other transplant patients, a cold can kill you because it can turn into pneumonia and you're dead. So we have to take it very seriously. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that uh, um, it, 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 it's an interesting situation to be in as somebody like me who is immune competent and I find myself not wearing masks and doing, basically going back to my pre-COVID life, but understanding that the people that I take care of and people that I interact with, they live a very different reality. We're, we're, we're in the same city, same planet, but you live a very different reality. Yep, it's never gonna be gone, you know, for me, that fear in the back of my mind. I'm always gonna wear my mask and do what I've been doing to keep myself safe. And even after four shots, my two for the series, plus two boosters, that was when I contracted COVID. So, you mentioned some things you're doing to try to keep yourself uh, protected. So you said uh, four shots, uh, and um, um, it, it, have you done or are you considering doing the latest booster? Is that the fourth shot? Uh, is that available in Canada, the bivalent booster? Yes, I've already done that yeah. after my infection. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I went to Evyshell, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. So talk about uh, Evusheld and, uh, and, and how you got to know about it and uh, how that made you feel when you took it, how it made you feel when it was gone. Okay, sure. The way it was introduced to us is from my transplant center, and we just have a voicemail system called Easy Call where we can call in with any issues to our transplant team, leave a message, and then they are really good about getting back to us with the information that we request. And let's put out a general message to all transplant patients that Evusheld is now available. And the way I understood it was, it was basically a booster for our boosters because we didn't know how effective the normal boosters were. And this was just an extra layer of protection. And like I said, I'm gonna do everything I can to protect myself as much as possible. So that was all great. I've gotten to the point now that I really only have to follow up with my transplant team twice a year at six month intervals. So I heard about Evusheld, and I said, okay, next time I'm down there, I'll go ahead and see about getting the shot, because it sounds like it's a good thing. Well, I get down to the transplant center, and there's a sign, a literal sign that says Evusheld Clinic with an arrow pointing this way. And I asked the people in the transplant team, and they didn't really have any information for me. So I go walking around on that floor saying, hey, I see the sign for Evusheld Clinic. I'm interested in getting the shot. We don't know what's going on. So that was very frustrating. And as a follow-up, I had left an easy call message. I got the call back that Ebuchel Clinic was still in existence, but it was only one day a week, which was a Friday, which didn't make a whole lot of sense because all of our transplant clinic visits are scheduled on Thursday. So it seemed that the people who need it the most, you would make sure the clinic is open when we're there. 
So then I said, all right, well, I'm not going to drive an hour and a half to two hours, which is how far I live from the transplant center, just to get a shot. There must be a way to find it locally. So I also belong to a group called the Transplant Ambassador Program, uh, which is kidney specific. And we have meetings once a month and just kind of share information about what's going on. And I heard from one of the members of the group that they had received an Evyshell shot at our local hospital. I said, okay, that sounds good. I live six minutes from the hospital. I'll see if I can get that shot. What's the process? They said, well, it's kind of weird because you have to get the shot at our local hospital, but you have to call another hospital because they're doing the scheduling of the shots. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't make too much sense to me, but that's what we'll do. So they didn't know the number to the other hospital, so I just called the pharmacy at the local hospital, and they said, yes, we do the shots, but you have to call this other number to get scheduled. So I called and had to leave a message, and then a doctor called me back and he said, well, that was the old system. Um, you are eligible for the shot from what we can tell from your records, but now we're one city over from where you are. I live in the city of Kitchener, it's Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge. So the people in Cambridge are making the schedule for the Kitchener, Waterloo people. And so he said, let me get back to you. You are eligible. We'll see if we can find you an appointment. So after all of this is done, I finally get the appointment and I go to the pharmacy at our local hospital, which is called Grand River in Kitchener. Got my two shots and they explained that we have to give you two because your muscles can only hold a certain amount and if we just gave you one, then we we're afraid that the amount that leaked out would leave you less protected than you should be. So we got two shots in each hip, and that was it. Wow. It, 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 I think it's, um, it's, it's quite eye-opening as a clinician to hear about the, uh, the journey that somebody has trying to get a medication that uh, can help them and, uh, you know, I, I know it intellectually, but to hear about it, it it's, it's... And I was one of the lucky ones. I mean, what if I hadn't been in that group? You know, I'd just been getting the runaround, and I might have not ever received my shot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So getting the information out there is a huge thing. That's something that we need to work on. So one of the reasons why we're doing this now is uh, that we don't have a product like Ev Shelled, but... We're optimistic that there is one that's coming, and I think it's important that we try to learn the lessons that you lived through your experience so that we can do a better job with uh, uh, drug 2.0 when it comes. So um, uh, I don't know if we'll do it, but I think it's worth at least trying to. So there was a uh, survey that was done by uh, Peerview, and I'm just going to go through some of the results, and then we'll have a, uh, a, a conversation through some of the things. Um, and uh, please uh, also um, uh, uh, put in questions if uh, there's things in there that, uh, that, that strike you as, uh, as interesting or worth asking about. So the survey methods were there were 19 questions about COVID preventions, masking vaccines, prevention drugs, uh, when they were available. All questions had multiple choice and some uh, open answer fields, 106 US-based patients. So we didn't have Canadian patients, but uh, uh, there were US-based patients with a variety of uh, immunocompromising conditions and other conditions that put them at risk for severe COVID. Uh, and most patients had more than one condition. So the, the first uh, question area is general prevention. And do patients know what to do? And social distancing, I think uh, we've done a fantastic job in terms of getting that message across uh, whether people do it or not, but that they know they did know about social distancing, they knew about masking, they knew about hand washing and sanitizer, they knew about vaccination, but a minority of patients knew about prevention drugs. This is when the prevention drugs uh, were existing. So 70% were unaware of prevention drugs. I'm gonna just uh, ask uh, Dr. Heider, uh, what do you think about that? That's consistent with what I've seen. Uh, and not, so, not specifically the vaccines, but specifically the preventative monoclonals, either the ones that can, and we'll be talking about this later, either the ones that, are, that were authorized for pre-exposure prophylaxis 
or for post-exposure protein, meaning that if you were immunodeficient, encountered someone with COVID-19, you could have gotten some monoclonals. This was a couple of years ago now, but most patients didn't know about this. So this is consistent with what I've seen. So it really tracks. And then how about uh, uh, you, uh, Mr. Cook, Charles? You told me not to call you Mr. Cook because that's your dad's name, so, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep working on it. So Charles, uh, does that track with your experience from people that you know that the vast majority of people don't really know that uh, there was an option? No, that doesn't surprise me at all. I think that's the surprising point is that it's no surprise. You know, that is pretty much my experience is what this graph shows. Mm -hmm. And then your experience is once you knew about it, then you had to go through a bunch of hoops to get through it. Some hoops to get it, yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, do patients actually do it? So uh, uh, we went uh, in the Evusheld part from 30% knew about it to less than 6% actually partook. So I can totally see, based on what you described, how you would get the attrition rate to say, you know, looks, looks like the medical system doesn't care. Why should I care? Exactly. If they're not taking it seriously, why should I? But that is the exact wrong message on either end. Now, I have never had Evusheld, but is the experience kind of off-putting to get the shot in the butt, or it's not really? Not really. I mean, if you've gone through a transplant, then getting two shots in your cheeks is nothing. No big so, deal. So that was kind of the easy part to actually get the medication. Uh, and this also tracks with your experience uh, that uh, uh, very few of the patients actually got no, it. I think in our system, probably 10, 15% of all eligible immunodeficient people ended up getting it. I think the logistics were a big part of it. I also think that even though many were aware or had been contacted, it was such a new thing that there was, I think, the sense of hesitation of, oh, do I really need to get this? And yeah. Because there's a lot of information coming at you, you know, mm -hmm. you got to get two shots, are you good, do I need three, do I need four, now this miracle drug is coming out, what do you believe? Mm -hmm. So I think there's probably a fatigue factor in there too. Yep. Yeah. And then also um, in, in terms of uh, organizing, I think in some places the drug was free, but the visit was, uh, um, you had to pay money or the insurance company had probably not an issue in Canada, right. but uh, in the U.S., did you experience some of that? Oh, yeah. That was a major barrier, not something that we had anticipated would be an issue and certainly not something that when the patient was coming to get the shot was on their radar, but then it, I think, deterred many people from coming back for their second dose, knowing that even though the drug itself was free, they would receive a sometimes thousands of dollar charge for, for just the for the facility and the infusion and the chair and that kind of thing. So then uh, in terms of uh, general prevention, what do people actually do? So um, uh, obviously a lot of different approaches to prevention. Uh, in immunocompromised and at-risk patients, the majority are still limiting social contact to a certain extent. We're wearing a mask. And when they're wearing a mask, uh, there's sometimes, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, um, uh, asked questions or people uh, feel, it, it, maybe it's sort of like, like, again, I've never been a pregnant woman, but it seems like everybody feels comfortable to touch the pregnant woman's belly. So right. maybe it, people just take license to make a comment about your mask. Mm -hmm. um, so that 35% uh, were comfortable without masking and uh, are not limiting social contact. So I, I think that that shows to me that the majority of people that are at risk are still not feeling the way they felt in, um, say, uh, November 2019. I would personally agree with that. I don't know if it's ever going to go back to being the same, you know, now that I have this knowledge and have had this experience. Mm -hmm. The world's always going to be a little bit skewed from what I knew before. Yeah. And, and I recently uh, was visiting family that I hadn't seen in a long time, and uh, both me and uh, another member of my family uh, actually got COVID um, on the trip, and then uh, we let the family know that we have COVID, and, uh, and, and you know, as expected, people didn't want to come for the get-together. 
totally understandable. And, uh, and, and the, the, um, the, the people at highest risk were the ones that immediately answered saying, no, this is not right for us. So um, it, it's still out there. Absolutely, and that's the thing we have to, to continually remind people. It's not gone. I don't care what the World Health Organization says, the end of the pandemic, we're still at risk. You know? And one of the dynamics that happens is um, somebody gets a little bit of a scratchy throat in 2023 and they don't want to check for COVID mm -hmm. because then they'll cancel the family uh, get together. And, uh, and, and you have to sort of suck it up and say, yes, I will do a COVID test. And if it's positive, we will call the family get together off. Um, so uh, the next shift is toward uh, some of the new agents that are coming and, and, and there's not a lot of them. But uh, uh, what do people want to know about them, people that uh, are at risk for severe COVID? So uh, most people were unaware that there's a new COVID prevention agents in development. And I, I think it has been sort of a, a little bit of a stealthy thing in that, uh, that, that most people don't know that, uh, that, that work is still being done on them. Of those that were aware, aware most heard that uh, uh, an agent is on the way through the internet, which is how we find out most information these days. And um, uh, only 26% of patients heard about it from healthcare professionals. So uh, transplant teams, oncology teams, uh, we've not done a great job in telling people that something is coming around the bend to prepare them. So I think like so often, a drug is gonna be authorized or approved and then we'll scramble to all of a sudden do the education now. So th there's the old, uh, I think it's Chinese saying, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago, the second best time is today. It seems like as healthcare profession, we're always going for the second best time. It definitely put in the cart before the horse. And we should learn from, you know, the mistakes we made the first time around is that the biggest thing was nobody knew about it. So get the word out and then educate the patients. Let them have the option to make the choice and you only make yeah. a good decision if you have good information to base it upon. And I know for myself, uh, the first time I hear something, uh, it sometimes just washes over me and it's when I hear about it again a second time. So if we can educate people that something is coming and then the second time when it's there, we talk to them and say, hey, now it's there, then th that can uh, um, sit in a different way in their head. And I'm not saying that they should take it, but I'm saying that they should be partners in making the decision whether to take something and hearing about it just one time may, may be too much. It's, uh, when you said that, it reminded me of something. I'm a big advocate for organ transplantation. <laughs> I'm living proof that it works. But I was told by the kind of governing body that handles stuff in my province of Ontario that people need to hear the message four times for them to act. The first time, if you ask somebody, hey, would you donate your organs when you pass away? Sure, of course. And then they don't register. The second time, yeah, I meant to do that. Third time, you know, I really should do that then the fourth time they go and do it. So we can't expect people to hear it one time, just like you said, and then go and jump on it. It has to be repeated until it actually sinks in and then people take action. So that's an excellent point. No, I, I, I think that's, uh, can I use it as a baseball analogy? First base, second base, third base, <laughs> and then score the run? Yep. He's giving me a dirty look. <laughs> He's like, there you go talking sports again. Yeah. So most people wanted to know, um, about um, is it safe, is it effective, how important is it gonna be, is it gonna cost me money, how much money is it gonna cost, uh, and um, uh, the main questions that we as uh, clinicians are thinking about, but also some of the logistical issues uh, are uh, uh, first and foremost. So if I were to tell you as a clinician, hey, there's a drug that's coming that's out today. What do you think your patients are gonna to wanna to know? And then I'm gonna ask you what you really wanna know. All right. Yeah, my gut would have been safety and effectiveness. And so it was, I mean, looking at affordable and availability and insurance makes perfect sense, but that's not where my mind goes to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you as a, um, as a recipient, what are you thinking? Using your analogy again of first, second, third, and then home plate. 
First, after my second transplant, which was my kidney, I was on 23 different medications. Fortunately, today, you know, six years later almost, I'm down to 15. What I want to know first is if it's safe to take with all those other medications. Is anything contraindicated? Okay, that's number one. Second is, does it work? Everybody was taking their vaccine, but because we're so immune compromised, it didn't give us the same response as someone with a normal immune system. Third is, where can I get it? Is it available? Am I gonna have to jump through all these hoops again? And then fourth, because it's not really a concern, north of the border is how much it's gonna cost. You know? So that's how I would rank them. Yeah, I, I think the, the cost issue is huge in uh, the United States in, in that uh, um, it, it, it's, it's this big black box. Sometimes you order a prescription for a drug that's like zillions of dollars and the patient pays $5 and sometimes you order something that's generic and they're, they're paying hundreds of dollars or more. It's, it's really sense. mysterious. Maybe you guys will invade us and... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, can patients access COVID-19 prevention drugs? Uh, uh, and, and this just tracks exactly the things that you were saying is there was little information that's available, the information that was available, like if it's available on a Thursday or a Friday, it, it was misleading. Um, so a lot of um, issues with accessing of drugs. Uh, now, I know at uh, it, our institution in Baltimore and at your institution, uh, um, individual people made Herculean efforts to get drug to people. And uh, I, on the one hand, amazing. On the other hand, I worry about fatigue. Will those people be able to step up for version 2.0 when it comes? Uh, or are we going to need something more uh, organized? Um, will patients use COVID prevention if counseled? So I think it, it depends. Uh, uh, so um, most people said that there uh, uh, were a chunk of patients said that nobody from the medical side talked to them about uh, prevention and um, of patients noting that their healthcare providers discussed prevention methods with them, none received information on uh, uh, prevention agents uh, at the time. And greater than 62 said that they would likely or be highly likely to use COVID if their healthcare providers were to counsel them about it. So we have, as clinicians, an important job in terms of getting that information out. And, and I can tell you that there were a lot of patients that I saw back when we were giving Evusheld that uh, were seeing me for recurrent urinary tract infection or something uh, in the transplant ID side. And I'd ask them, hey, what about Evusheld? And that was the first time they ever heard about it. So. Um, and uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, how the survey compared with yours. So I don't think we need to go to this specific slide. Anything else that I missed that you think we should talk about? I just think the last point um, that you made about talking to the patients when they're there, you know, don't make them come in for a special Ebuchel education session. Yep. Just talk about it all the time if it's something that we need. And it all comes back to trust. You know, I have to trust that you have my best interest in mind you're the expert on the medicine, I'm the expert on me. So give me the information and allow me to make the decision, but then respect my decision. Yep. You know, it has to be a team effort. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, I am uh, transitioning now, uh, uh, handing off to uh, uh, Dr. Geider. He's uh, assistant professor of medicine, division of infectious disease, in, and uh, uh, director of uh, research, bone marrow transplant and hematopoietic malignancy ID, and program director of the transplant ID fellowship at uh, UPMC. Take it away. Thanks so much, and thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. So, we're going to start off talking about some of the data about COVID-19 prevention, and I'm gonna give you a case first. Um, and so this patient is in his 60s, he's had a liver transplant over five years ago and got one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine and is on the fence about getting additional doses because he's concerned about safety, he's concerned about effectiveness in organ transplant recipients. 
Um, he used to be masked, but now, within the past year, as the world has begun to move on, he's changing his mind and he wants to get back to living and get on with his life. Um, so, you know, what does this survey tell us about, about a patient like this? It seems as though um, at this stage there's a sense that COVID-19 is less of a threat than it was before and that no one else in the world is masking or avoiding crowds and also the comment about being difficult, kind of feeling uncomfortable uh, wearing a mask to, um, to um, avoid crowds. And, but I, I do want to highlight again that the pandemic, even though the public health emergency is technically over, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay, obviously, and the pandemic is, and it's not over for immunodeficient people. Mm -hmm. So here's a Kaplan-Meier curve uh, showing you the uh, chance of survival if you get COVID-19 based on what kind of transplant you have. And as you can see, the lowest graph is lung transplants, meaning that lung transplant recipients are much more likely to die than other organ transplant recipients, um, which makes sense because you're infecting the actual uh, uh, transplanted organ. Um, and there's, I think, a question that you need to answer, um, and then I'll move on. Now, there are vaccines, and, and the vaccines are safe in organ transplant recipients, the issue becomes they are less effective than in people with otherwise normal immune systems. And what I'm showing you here are antibody data, as in the proportion of organ transplant recipients who develop a detectable SARS-CoV-2 antibody response after they get a vaccine. And if you just look at the graph, you can see the numbers incrementally going up after each vaccine dose. So after a single dose, of a COVID-19 vaccine, really only about 17% of organ transplant recipients develop an antibody response. If you look at the same studies in otherwise healthy, immunocompetent people, that number was essentially 100%. And so just to show you the stark difference between SOT and otherwise immunocompetent people, you give dose two, that proportion goes up to in the 60s, give dose three, also in the 60s, give dose four, you go up to the 80s. Meaning that the more and more you give vaccines, eventually most SOT recipients are going to develop some kind of antibody response, but you're still stuck with a substantial percentage that is simply not going to mount any antibody response no matter what you do. And risk factors include things like if you're older, if you, let's say you have a lung transplant, if you're on high doses of cell sept and things like that, and there really still is an unmet need to try to prevent COVID-19 in individuals like this. What, what you see below is also the T cell response, which also kind of tracks with the antibody response. More vaccines equals you're probably gonna also develop a more robust um, T cell response. I think there's another poll. Now, the, um, the poor antibody responses are also translated into poor clinical outcomes. So unfortunately, even though, again, the world has moved on and most of us have reaped the benefits of vaccines and if we get COVID-19, it's mild, for SOT recipients, they have not reaped these benefits. And, uh, and so if you just look at the first square and then the last square, so the first square shows you these are data based on, on the CDC from a couple of years ago. So over 100 million fully vaccinated um, immunocompetent adults. And the proportion of breakthrough was very low, so 0.01%. And then if you look at the proportion of the people who, who were hospitalized, it is, you know, there's like three zeros after the, after the decimal and even smaller proportion of those who died. So the vaccines worked very well if you were otherwise healthy. Now, if you go to the last square, you will see that in transplant patients, all the numbers are higher. So much more likely to get a breakthrough infection, much more likely to be hospitalized, and much more likely to die with 9.3%, nearly 10% mortality, even if, you're, even if you're vaccinated. And if you compare these two numbers, and these data have been published in the reference below, so SOT recipients have over an 80%-fold greater uh, risk of breakthrough infection and nearly a 500-fold risk of infection with hospitalization and death. Um, it doesn't mean that vaccination is futile. It's better to get vaccinated than not. And what you're looking at here is a study um, 
that's looking at kidney, liver, or liver kidney recipients, and just looking at survival with COVID-19 based on whether or not you've been, you've been vaccinated. And the top graph is the vaccinated arm, the bottom graph in orange is unvaccinated, and the y-axis is survival. So vaccination does still confer a benefit, but the benefit is simply not as pronounced as if you didn't have an organ transplant, which again, we need to figure out better ways to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection in these, in these patients. And so now I'm gonna shift away from vaccines and talk about monoclonal antibodies to prevent COVID-19, which unfortunately no longer exists in this country because of the emergence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants that have developed resistance to them. But the first one, and we're gonna be talking a bit more about this, is Tixagivimab and Silgavimab, which had been authorized for pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP for about a year, a little over a year, um, the other two, which I'll, I'm just going to call, uh, so I'll, I'll pronounce the full names, Bamlanivimab and Etisevimab, um, which was only available for post-exposure prophy for a couple of months, I think, and then Casarivimab and Imdivimab, which also was available for post-exposure prophy for a couple of months. I think this was in tw at the end of 2021-ish, but uh, we don't have them anymore, unfortunately. So these are no longer options to protect people with, immuno with immunodeficiencies. Now, Dr. Dr. Shoham, I think, is going to go a bit more about a lot of the nuances when it comes to the uh, tixagivimab and silcavimab data. There's a lot of studies out there, and it's difficult to, to pick and choose. But this, this is a large study um, from, the UC, from the UCSD health, health system. And what you're looking at here is the um, proportion of hospitalizations among um, their immunocompromised people, so everyone, in for, for COVID-19 in the era preceding tixagivimab and silgavimab over here, and in the era following tixagivimab and silgavimab where they started to give it. And you can clearly appreciate that there was just much less hospitalizations for COVID-19 in the tixil era. Um, in that meaning that in the era when tixil was being given. So probably um, a quarter of, of the other one, uh, 24% versus 6%, and this persisted in when they looked at the different subgroups, so it was most pronounced in people with, hem with hematological cancers, so leukemia, lymphoma, and stem cell recipients, and things like that, and in solid organ transplant recipients. And these two populations are actually the most likely to not respond to vaccines and to do poorly when they develop uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, and there's, this is a meta-analysis uh, meta that has also looked at this as well. So you'll see that the effectiveness against breakthrough was only 40%. And by breakthrough, I mean any positive SARS-CoV-2 test. And this, I think, makes sense. I don't know, think we really expect these drugs to prevent you from getting infected completely. The objective is to prevent you from getting infected and then getting into the hospital ICU and dying. And as you can see, the effectiveness against those harder outcomes, like hospitalization, ICU, and death, was, was, was really good. So in the 60% range, in the 80% range, and, and, in the, and in the 90% range. And I, but again, this drug no longer exists in this, in this country. Um, so how can we prevent COVID-19 and immunodeficient people? As far as drugs, it's vaccines. That, that really is all there is at this point. As, far as drugs. There are trials uh, coming along for monoclonals that Dr. Shoham will talk to you about. But again, and I think we all know this, but it's important to emphasize not just to vaccinate the patient, but the bubble around the patient and also masking. And again, the world is moving on. I no longer wear a mask in public, but I think for immunodeficient people, it's important to just keep reminding them of this. I try not to be too prescriptive to just make them aware that the risk is still there for you. And ultimately, I think people can make their own decision, but it's important to emphasize that masks do work and the risk is still there. And at our center, for example, we, um, we at some point we had universal masking everywhere. About a month ago, we've now only restricted that to our high-risk units, specifically our organ transplant units and our stem cell transplant units, because these individuals are at the highest risk of getting um, um, COVID-19. Um, now, vaccine hesitancy has been an issue. And as an internist, I'm not really used to dealing with parents and children. I think our, my PEDS colleagues are much more adept at dealing with vaccine 
hesitancy, but it was really interesting having these uh, conversations. And so in this, in this survey, you'll see that most, so uh, around three quarters of organ transplant recipients had planned on receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. 5% didn't, and then 22% were kind of on the fence about it. And they were, their attitudes were in general less positive than, uh, than the people who said yes. And they were worried about the poor effectiveness, that there weren't really any trials in organ transplant recipients, and um, they were worried that the transplanted organ itself would be adversely affected. Um, just to remind everyone, the vaccines are safe in SOT recipients, and, and there are no concerns when it comes to the graft and things like that. Um, but most people, and this has been my experience too, when you're on the fence, you're willing to listen with just some information, and if, you're, and if your provider also uh, tells you that it's something that, that, uh, that uh, you should do. And so this is overall kind of general guidance on how to approach this. And again, as an internist, it was really interesting to start having these discussions. Um, I think it's important to be curious and not to, and that's my approach, and not to come with preconceived notions and judgments about, about these things. And we're not here to pick a fight with the patients or get into politics and all sorts of sorted things. You go into the room, you're curious, you really want to try to understand what the specific concerns are, and then any misinformation that you get, you really try your best to counter with objective facts. And, and in many people this works, and, and in some it does not. And if it does not, it, it just doesn't. And, and I think also there was a specter of concern about the adverse effects, and I think we as providers countering this with all the safety data I think it does something, and there was um, a few years ago. I was on a. I was asked to be part of, to speak at a patient advocacy group for individuals with certain kinds of blood cancers, and it was a, a group of patients, and and I think I was able to convince many of them to go and get vaccinated, and they were very outspoken and, and asked me a, a lot of questions, and there were all these errors that were clearly misinformation that I, I think I was able to correct, and I, and I think that that, that helped. Um, so, Charles, how do you think a clinician should talk to you about, about preventing COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing you said was being curious. Come in, we're going to have a conversation. You know, you're not going to be lecturing me on what I should or shouldn't do. Give me the information. Let me decide you know, if it's right for me, if I don't think it's right, let me ask you, you know, can you clarify something or whatever, but then respect my decision. You know, like I said before was, you're the expert on the medicine, I'm the expert on me, it's my body, and I have the final say so. But I would like to think that we're working together as a team, you know, for my benefit, so. I agree, yeah. all right. Um, the interest of time, uh, do, you, do you wanna add something? Yeah, I, I, I was struck by uh, the concern that uh, uh, patients had about a vaccine impacting their organ, and, and it, it seems completely rational to me that uh, one would be fearful of an immune-stimulating agent causing immune stimulation and damaging the organ. Uh, so first is, uh, Gotti, what do you think about the, the science? Is the science there that vaccines can harm uh, uh, organs? And then uh, what are your thoughts as a patient about that? I think the science at this point has shown that it's completely safe for the, for the allograft. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I don't have any concerns there. I think something that you said before, it actually uh, struck me and brought back a memory about my experience with COVID is first I had a scratchy throat. And then, you know, I had a temperature, and so I knew something was wrong. Because as a transplant patient, the biggest fear is rejection of that organ. And so you're taught to protect it from the day that you receive it, and you have to take medication for the rest of your life to make sure that it still works. So, of course, we're going to be concerned about anything that could harm it. And if the education isn't out there or the information, then how do we know if this works or if this is gonna be bad for us? It is not an easy journey to receive an organ transplant and you don't wanna do anything at all to jeopardize that. So that's where the hesitancy comes from. So the education part is very important. Yeah, I once had a uh, kidney transplant recipient told me, he said, you do what you can to save this kidney because if I lose it, I don't wanna live. 
obviously that's a personal choice. Right. But, uh, sometimes that's how people. Because the only way you can live without the kidney is back on dialysis, and I experienced in-center dialysis for 15 months, and then I was trying to do dialysis at home for 15 months immediately preceding my transplant, and in-center dialysis, some I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. So I know what they're talking about. You know, if you can't, if your life is devoted to being on that machine three times a week then it's not really a life. You're not living, you're existing. So I can understand yeah. what they were saying. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, I think we'll go next. All right. Now I'm going to qu quickly pivot um, about how to treat COVID-19 and SOT recipients in, in, uh, uh, in the current era. And so this is the, the same patient um, who now comes back with suspected uh, COVID with a positive home test. And so these are the drugs. The, the first four drugs are the available outpatient therapies, and these are the antivirals. So they act on the virus itself, not on the, on the uh, immune system. And these are the recommendations from the American Society of Transplantation. So remdesivir, which is intravenous and requires three days in a row outpatient infusion, so there's logistical issues there, is um, recommended. Uh, Nermatrovir, ritonavir, aka Paxlovid. You'll see a plus minus. This isn't about effectiveness. This is just because the ritonavir component is a interacts with so many drugs, including the transplant drugs, methcalcinurin and inhibitors the, and the mTOR inhibitors, that it is very dangerous to just give this drug on its own without having a plan to preemptively adjust the levels of the other drugs. And I know many centers don't use Paxlovid and SOT recipients specifically for this concern because it's very high maintenance, even though as far as effectiveness, it's extremely effective. The other one is molnupiravir, where the effectiveness data are probably much, much lower than the others. And then there's convalescent plasma, which many centers haven't really been able to, to use anymore just from practical and logistical considerations of obtaining enough uh, high titer CP to give to the patients. Now, when you, so all these are for outpatient treatments and, and for mild disease. When you move into, uh, and when you move into hospitalization, that's when uh, you begin to target the immune system. And I'm just gonna focus on, and so you can keep giving remdesivir, and I think all of us would give an SOT recipient remdesivir, regardless of where the disease is. The other two drugs, the oral antivirals, Paxlovid and, Molnup and Molnupiravir, aren't authorized to be given as inpatients. It doesn't mean that they won't work for organ transplant recipients, it just means that the data evidence is just not there yet. We've already talked about the issues with CP, and then you get into steroids. So steroids is really just restricted in people who are on oxygen. It should not be given to people who do not receive oxygen. Um, and at our center, we, that's, that's what we adhere to, and that's what the data show. And um, you can get worse outcomes, actually, if you, if you give it uh, without needing oxygen. Then the other drugs like tocilizumab and baricitinib, so IL-6 inhibitors and JAK2 inhibitors, I think while they might be recommended maybe for immunocompetent people, I think the body of evidence for organ transplant recipients isn't there. A lot of us are concerned of how immunosuppressive these drugs might be, and so we, we use them very judiciously in solid organ transplant recipients. These are the NIH guidelines. They're basically the same, except the order of Paxlovid and remdesivir is flipped, and that's because this doesn't specifically regard transplant patients. Um, and so the, the, all that fine print about ritonavir isn't there, although be aware there's a lot of fine print. So there's hundreds of drugs that Paxlovid interacts with, and you cannot prescribe this drug without knowing what the patient is taking. And also be aware that as of about a weekish ago, this drug has been FDA approved. Um, access to COVID-19 treatments is a huge problem. Um, and and the, the, the bar graphs over here show you kind of risk factors for uh, not having any COVID-19 therapies available. And it's, for instance, living in a non-metropolitan area, living in a high poverty area, or, or uh, being of a, uh, of a minority pop, pop population. So we really need to work harder to make sure that these treatments are, are 
are available. Patients need to have access to testing so that we know what we are treating. Uh, we need to make it easier for them to get the drugs from pharmacies or to ship the drugs to their homes. I'm talking about the oral pills now. People need to be more and more aware of these drugs. And this is a very useful website that I still use to this day um, just to track where specifically you can buy um, um, COVID-19 drugs. Oh, All right, sorry. my turn. Oops. All right, so uh, unmet need, lack of authorized and effective COVID-19 prevention agents in immunocompromised patients. So what happened here? Um, this is a study where they took patients that had uh, various antibody responses after vaccination, and they gave them uh, tixagevimab, siljavimab, evusheld. And you can see that uh, the amount of antibodies that could neutralize BA4-5 went up, or if they were already high, they stayed up. Great, it was working. But then as Omicron evolved, it uh, was no longer effective, and now you were not getting that kind of bump and patients were no longer getting protected, and the FDA therefore said uh, it's pointless to give it. Uh, it's a fairly non-toxic drug, but it's not zero toxicity, and uh, it just wasn't worth the effort. So that's why it was taken off the market. What did we learn? When it was effective, we learned that it could somehow, somewhat prevent infection, but not really all that well, but really where it's shown is in terms of preventing hospitalization, uh, just the points that uh, Dr. Heider was uh, making. So I think we've really learned along the way that antibodies are not that great at preventing COVID. They are good at preventing COVID complications. So uh, uh, whether it's a vaccine-induced antibody or whether it's a, a, an exogenous antibody. We also learned that it depends on what kind of patient. So this is a study that was done late in the Omicron wave, uh, or, or actually in the Omicron wave. Uh, patients got Evusheld, they were lung transplant patients, and there was a non-statistically significant reduction in hospitalization, uh, 0.082, but uh, when they used patients that were propensity matched, small study, no difference. When they looked at duration of hospitalization, no difference. So I think what I'm trying to tell you is that every shell will not make your teeth whiter and your clothes cleaner and will solve everything. Uh, and uh, you have to look at the kind of patient and of what kind of match you're having with uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the virus that's out there. Other things that we learned is if you look at the ancestral strain and uh, you gave uh, Evusheld uh, plus patients that uh, already had uh, uh, antibody from vaccine and they were able to stay protected for a long time. But as Omicron came on and as it developed, the level of protection at three months started falling. So neutralizing antibody activity waned after about three months in, uh, uh, in, in, in patients uh, that uh, received uh, in vaccinated patients. What do, we, what do we take from that is that the six months that we're counting on may not exactly be six months. Maybe it'll be different with uh, Evusheld version 2.0 when it comes out, but uh, I, I think that uh, as patients are entering month four or five increased uh, risk. How that will uh, uh, play out, not sure, but something to keep in mind. All right, so I think we're moving on to uh, a little bit of a panel discussion, but uh, one of the uh, uh, questions that came out that I wanted to hit you with is, um, um, uh, what information do clinicians need in order to facilitate um, the, um, um, the um, in order to educate patients about uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Say pre-exposure prophylaxis comes back on the market, 
what, is it, what information do you need to educate your patients? Well, I think that the, so I think a person like, like me and you who are very much in this field, I, I think we're kind of very much aware of these data very intimately. I think the more important thing is to try to educate the non-subspecialists, the mm -hmm. primary care physicians or the transplant docs who aren't transplant infectious disease physicians because I think to this day we still get a lot of questions from, from these individuals who, because I'm usually not the first line of defense for the patients. They might go ask their PCP, hey, have you heard of Evusheld? And the PCP usually will, will have not. So I think there needs to be effort to access the PCPs and the transplant docs or the oncologists and educate those groups a bit more about um, COVID-19 prevention with monoclonals. And, and I think the upcoming trial, which is going to be specifically looking at immunocompromised people, I think getting those results out there to, to, to those groups will be key. And I think the point you made about uh, um, thinking outside of our bubble as uh, uh, clinicians that take care of immunocompromised patients and pushing out to where the patients actually are, which is, so you say you see your transplant team a couple times a year? That's it. I see my family doctor a lot more. So getting the information to the family doctor would be a great help because they're the person and that's kind of like your first line of defense. You see them more often, so you have that relationship with them. You've already built up that trust and coming from them, then it's just a conversation, you know, not a lecture from your transplant doctor. And, and I think one of the things that your family doctor is going to want to know is, do you remember those ads that they used to have for, uh, um, it was Home Depot or one of those companies where you push the button and something happened? I think they're going to know, want to know, is there a button that they can push to make it happen? Because they're not part of a transplant center and plugged into how things could happen. So I think that was Staples. Staples, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So th th that's what we need, a staples button for making uh, the monoclonal antibody happen. Um, all right, so th these are some of the issues that uh, how has losing access to prevention uh, affected transplant patients? Uh, so you're looking at this list, uh, Charles. Is there anything that you would add to the list? I think the biggest thing is, like you said, put the information and the drug where we are. Don't make it hard for us to get to. Don't make it hard for us to find out about it. And I think the other thing is going back to the trust is what all of this is about, is I trust someone more if they say, hey, we tried this before, we messed up, we're trying to do better this time, instead of somebody coming saying, hey, I have the answer to all your prayers, I know everything. Then no, you don't, because nobody does. You know, let's try to work on this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feeling our way through it. Exactly, and let's do it together. All right, so here are some emerging prevention agents. So at the top is AZD3152. That's the AstraZeneca product that uh, is uh, in development. Uh, there is a list of other products. Uh, uh, and I don't have a lot of um, um, belief that emtricitabine tenofovir is going to be a miracle drug for COVID. Uh, there's some combination uh, monoclonals that are in development in phase one. There is uh, uh, a, a, uh, three monoclonal antibodies in one, iBio123, and there's some other drugs. I guess the one I'm most excited about is oral remdesivir, uh, but uh, you know, we'll see if, uh, if and when that comes uh, out. Um, any other drugs that's not on this list that you've heard about? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, so one of the drugs that, that I mentioned is AZD3152, and this is data that was presented at ECMID. And uh, if you're not used to looking at these curves, uh, being up here is good, being down here is bad. And uh, against all these different viruses, including this one, which uh, I like the name, uh, Arcturus. That's the newest uh, uh, version of, uh, of, of XBB1, which uh, has been associated with conjunctivitis. It's active against all of those um, in terms of neutralization. Whether it'll be active against uh, their kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, we don't know. But uh, hopefully the treatments will become more stable because already um, there's a lot of... Um, uh, 
immunity in the population. I think 99% of people have either been vaccinated or have had COVID or have had both. So the engine to drive diversity is just not as high as it used to be. So hopefully uh, the new drug that uh, is in development, AZD3152 and other ones, will uh, be a little bit more durable than what we've seen with the whack-a-mole of monoclonal antibody that come on and then resistance develops. Uh, this is the supernova trial. I'm kind of jealous that uh, it has such a cool name. Uh, it's a phase uh, one three. It says one two, but it's a phase one three randomized control trial. Uh, the goal is to establish the safety and efficacy of AZD3152, which is a uh, monoclonal antibody effective, as I showed you, against uh, a lot of the uh, uh, against the viruses uh, that are out there. And they're comparing it to uh, Evusheld. Uh, that's sort of acting as the placebo, if you will. Uh, and uh, the primary endpoint is sa safety and neutralizing activity of a shot of that stuff. Um, and um, this is the part where we sort of come in with what lessons have we learned? So who are the patients that are candidates for a next generation preventive agent? So obviously somebody who didn't have an allergy, uh, but then immunocompromised patients. Uh, this is the American Society of Transplantations. I think we'll focus on the organ transplant patients very much so. And I would say, is there an organ transplant patient subtype that you would say, okay, if you only have like, uh, one Evusheld dose to give, who would you give it to? Thank Charles, you. of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Aside from Charles, I think it would be a lung yeah. transplant. But uh, who would you give it to? Hmm? I, I, I was saying I would give it to Charles, but if I had two doses, one to give to Charles and one to give to somebody else, who would I give it to? I think lung transplant, if I were to pick one organ type, they are at the highest risk. Any, any role for antibody testing, or has that gone out the window? I think that remains controversial, and I continue to be ambivalent about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm not sure. I mean, our system, when we began to give out Evusheld, we made, an, we made a decision not to rely on antibody testing, meaning that one approach was test the SARS-CoV-2 antibody. If it's positive, don't give. If it's negative, give. And that, that makes sense, but then... It gets complicated, you would have to enforce that, get the patients go and get tested, or insurance may not pay for it, and the antibody result is also a snapshot. So if your antibody level was five today, well, what happens next month when it's zero? And so we decided not to rely on that to operationalize Evusheld, though I know that other, other centers did. Yeah, uh, it, and I would say that uh, lung transplants, like you said, they would be super high on my list uh, because in addition to the infection, they can also get rejection and then uh, chronic uh, rejection. Um, ensuring access, I think that's going to be a work in progress, but I think it's, it's the, probably the most important next step. The, the, the first step is to prove safety, efficacy, immunogenicity. That's happening. You're one of the investigators on the study. But the second part, which is, I think, where the, uh, using a football analogy, it's like the running game where the, the, the real game is won or lost is going to be delivering it to people. Um, so outreach to ambulatory patients, again and again and again, that's going to be super important. Uh, inpatients, uh, one of the things that we did sort of toward the end of the life cycle of Evusheld is you, you're a transplant patient, you're in the hospital for a UTI, whatever, on the way out the door, we give you a dose of Evusheld. Um, I, I think we got to be very organized about that. Uh, here are some uh, uh, things that uh, patients have shared, uh, and um, uh, I think you can read that. Uh, uh, but uh, make it easily available, I think, is one of the most uh, important things. Uh, some conclusions, vaccines can help limit progression of infect infection, uh, but they can't really prevent infection all that well. They're just, and, and they're not durable. We uh, uh, need to get vaccinated again and again. Monoclonal antibodies currently not available, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, by uh, the fall or by this time next year, we'll have much better news about and availability. Antiviral drugs can be used to treat COVID, uh, but um, uh, 
uh, as uh, Gadi was mentioning, the issue of the ritonavir is a huge issue. The issue of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, remdesivir needing three doses is an issue. One of the things that I'd like to find out is, do they really need three doses? Is one dose enough? Can we stratify? Are there certain patients that you want to give five doses to and other patients that you can give one dose to? Um, and, uh, of course, uh, COVID is not going to disappear. Hopefully, it will uh, continue to slide down to less relevance than it had, but it's not going to disappear and uh, some of the lessons that we learned from that. Um, and um, uh, please, if there's additional questions, put them in. And I think this is the last slide that we have. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're over time. This, this is one of those situations where the soccer ref has his uh, stopwatch and is now blowing the whistle. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if people have other questions, you can come up and uh, we'll answer them. Thank you.